Well, hi everyone and welcome back to Open Minded. And today I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. James Mukey. Now this guy is absolutely amazing. Australian of the year. He's also achieved many other things. He has a work and a passion for blindness prevention, social impact and humanitarian efforts. He co-founded an organization, organization named Sight for All. Today, we're going to talk about his story. I mean, I'm not even going to tease you, but we're going to go to Africa. We're going to go into poor communities. We're going to talk about some of the amazing highlights, but also some of the scary things uh, in James's life. So James, thank you very much for, for joining us, my friend. Uh, we are what I would call new friends. I've met you a couple of times on Zoom, which is the modern world, but the last time we spoke, you absolutely inspired me. So can you just give us a little bit of a background um, about your passion for blindness for all? That was really intrigued me. I didn't even think about blindness that often, to be fair. No, fair, absolutely sure. I mean, thank you, JK. It's lovely to be here this morning. And, and thanks for inviting me to be a part of your Open Minded podcast. It's really, really special to be here and to, to see you. And uh, uh, you have been... Uh, a legend in, in rugby. I was an ex-rugby player, actually. I, I grew up in Canberra, so I'm a, I'm a rugby union player from way back. Uh, passionate Wallaby supporter. Good to see the uh, the match on on the weekend. Um, oh, what, and what a Dr. James! What a great game! Yeah, How good was inc it? Inc incredible, incredible. Um, anyway, yeah. two more two more to go, so that's going to be good to exactly. keep an eye on what happens. Exactly. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm an eye surgeon. Uh, I'm a doctor and you know, as you say, I have a passion for fighting blindness and really it stems way back. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor for as long as I could remember. Uh, there was nothing in my early years that drove me down the pathway of medicine. It just was one of those things I knew from the earliest years I wanted to, to do, to be a part of, uh, to help people really, I think. Uh, I also had a passion for using my hands. You know, in my early years, I used to love putting together model airplanes and model tanks from the World War II. And, and so this idea of using my hands, helping people, uh, ultimately wanting to do surgery was the thing that drove me uh, through high school, studied hard, studied my ass off to get into medicine and unfortunately did get into medicine. And then as I worked my way through medicine, I had this idea uh, that, that eye surgery and particularly the microsurgery uh, was something that was really appealing to me. During my medical school, school uh, years, I did a medical elective in in Kenya, and I came across this little hospital in the mountains of Kenya uh, called Tumu Tumu Hospital. And my wife's just bringing me a coffee, thank you. Um, that'll help me get through the morning. Uh, so uh, <laughs> um, I came across this little hospital in the mountains of Kenya, Tumu Tumu Hospital, and, and it just was beautiful. And I thought one day I'd love to come back and work here. So uh, during my internship, was, which was my first year of practicing real medicine, I became a little disillusioned. I was you know, I was on the back of really 12 years, six years of high school, six years of medical school, really studying hard. Uh, so I needed a break from the study. Uh, that first year of practicing real medicine, I was mainly seeing patients who had chronic diseases that were self-inflicted diseases uh, caused by things like smoking and, and a poor diet and, and just needed a change. I just needed something different. And so during my internship, I, I remembered that time I had in Africa as a... As a um, during my medical elective as a medical student and, and I wrote to the director of the hospital. He invited me back and so I went back to, to work as a volunteer doctor uh, in this hospital for a year, which was just a, a life-changing year for me. You know, for the first time, I was now able to treat patients who had diseases that, that weren't self-inflicted, that were mainly infectious diseases, things like malaria, TB. And so I love the fact... I'll just, Dr. James, I'll just stop you there because I was really interested because you said, like, you know, when I was a young fella, the first thing I said, I didn't say mum and dad, I said all blacks, right? Um, I, I wanted to be a fireman like every other kid. So you, from as long as you can remember, wanted to be a doctor. And then you just mentioned that you, you were disillusioned. So, I mean, how did you come to the realisation that you were disillusioned and you wanted to make change? Because that's courageous, right? Yeah, I, well, it's a long time ago now, so I can't remember the, the specifics. But I'm, I think myself, I'm a, a person that likes results, likes being able to achieve change, make things happen. And with chronic illness, 
you're really just alleviating symptoms, uh, improving quality of life, extending length of life, but not being able to cure. And so that, that was a frustration for me. It just, I suppose it wasn't my mindset, it wasn't my personality, not being able to cure people. Frustrating. So uh, when I was suddenly able to cure people in Africa, it, it really did uh, inspire me that this is, this is something I wanted to do. To, it reinvigorated the love for, for medicine. And it also inspired me to pursue a career in public health. And I mentioned before that I, I wanted to do surgery, but particularly microsurgery, I was starting to get an interest in, in eyes. And so the idea of actually curing blindness, uh, particularly cataract blindness, which is the leading cause of blindness in the world, makes up something like 90% uh, of blindness in, in poorer countries, was something that, that was really calling out to me. So it was the ability to cure, the ability to use my hands and use, use my hands to perform fine work and also to help people in poorer communities. So it was those three things that really came together at that time to, to drive me down this pathway. And, and so curable diseases in Africa, often, you know, we think that they have the non-curable ones and we have the curable ones. So what you're saying to me is that you go to Africa and you realise you can do so much good. Was there a lot of blindness that you felt you could have prevented? Were you already, I can't even, ophthalmologist? Is that how I say it? I don't even know how to spell that. But <laughs> were, you, were you an eye surgeon by then or you're still trying to find your way? It's harder to spell than it is to say. So it's ophthalmologist. No, I, I actually didn't come across anything uh, in my time in Africa, which was uh, anything to do with blindness. But during my, in my final year of medical school, I had a, uh, we had a number of lectures and we had a, a bit of time uh, you know, observing ophthalmology. And, and it's something that just tweaked my interest immediately. And in fact, before I went to Sorry, during my internship, actually, I, I approached the, the uh, director of the eye department at the time, and I said to him, I want to, I want to, I'm really interested in doing ophthalmology, but I actually want to have a break for a year. I just want to go to Africa and just have this experience. And, you know, would that actually put me at a disadvantage of getting into the ophthalmology training program? And he said, absolutely not at all. Uh, he said that if there were two people coming for the job and you'd have this experience and broadened your horizons, I would be you know, leaning towards you as the, as the uh, appropriate candidate, which was really reassuring to me because I'd only heard during my internship, I was exploring a number of opportunities of what I wanted to specialise in. And I was hearing from so many people that, oh, if you leave the system, you'll never get back in. If you, if you, um, you know, if you go to Africa, forget it, you know, your opportunity to specialise will be over. And maybe that was the case in some specialties, but in ophthalmology, uh, the director, as I said, he embraced the idea and that gave me the reassurance to go off and have this extraordinary experience. And uh, I was so grateful. One of the most important pieces of advice I've ever received is to, you know, to follow that dream. But at one stage, you're actually fearing for your life. Can you tell us that story? So you go on this adventure and then you're scared of getting murdered or whatever. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've had, during that, during that time, I had quite a number of experiences which were life-threatening. I don't know how I actually survived the year, to be honest. Uh, the, the one which I suppose was pr probably the most confronting was uh, really started before I actually, or really happened before I started work. So before I started at the hospital in Kenya, I just wanted to have a, a bit of time traveling. And particularly, I wanted to go and visit the gorillas in Rwanda. You know, if you know the map of East Africa, so Kenya is in East Africa. Rwanda is southwest of, of Kenya. It's a landlocked country. Now, I'd saved, I'd saved through my entire internship. This was my first year of earning money so that I could volunteer for the entire year. So I didn't have a lot of money, and so I couldn't afford to fly there. So I had to go by land. So I, I actually went via southern Uganda. So I took the night train to the border with Uganda, and then on through southern Uganda. And much of Uganda was still in civil war at the time. So this was 1989. And I eventually made it to the southwest corner. This was the only safe part of the country. It was a sort of government held part of the country. When Idi Amin, we all remember Idi Amin, the former brutal dictator of Uganda, he was attempting to come back into Uganda, the country that had deposed of his evil rule a few years before that. So he actually sent an advanced party of rebel soldiers to pave the way for his return and I just happened to find myself in the very same village 
at the very same time that this group of men decided to stop for the night. And so I was actually with a traveling companion, a guy called Mike from New York City. He'd never left New York City before. He, he wanted to go and visit the gorillas in Rwanda as well. So we, we met up and we were traveling together. So we were in this village. And, and uh, the moment we set foot in this village, we were surrounded by this ragtag bunch of very heavily armed men. They were drunk, they were filthy, and they were very, very menacing. So it tore apart our backpacks. They were looking for weapons. Of, of course, they didn't find any weapons, but they found our binoculars, and so they accused us of being spies. In fact, they, they told us that they'd seen us spying on them from the hills above the village. And so they marched us away at gunpoint, and they locked us up in this ramshackle hut at the edge of the village, and they told us to behave ourselves, and then they left us alone in the hut. So we, we were absolutely petrified, you can imagine. We were, we were convinced if we stayed in that hut and in that village, we, we were done for. Uh, Mike was absolutely freaking out. He, um, he was, uh, he, as I said, he'd never left New York City before. So he was only going to see the gorillas. He hadn't signed up to be captured by a different type of gorilla. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, I somehow managed to, to keep my call and I said, Mike, we've got to get out of here. So we actually broke out the back of the hut and escaped the village into the jungle behind. And uh, this was as night was falling, so it was dusk and an African jungle is not the place that you want to be at feeding time. Anyway, there's more to that story I can keep on going, but, but obviously I survived and, and uh, ended up getting back to Kenya and, and spending my year working as a doctor. But, you know, it was a pretty confronting experience. What's your my mindset, Dr. Jones? What's your mindset like? Not many of us have been in a life and death situation. So what's your mindset when you're sitting in that hut? I mean, can you, can you think back to things where you just thought, I'm actually going to die if I stay, but I risk dying if I go. How, how, how do you come to a decision? And, and um, you know, your traveling companion, Mike, he's shitting himself. So who, who, what happens? What's the mind process there? Again, it's 30 years ago, so I can't quite remember the details, but uh, I know that I, I you know, you have, to, you have to actually weigh up the consequences of staying. I mean, these guys, as I mentioned, they were seriously menacing. So we got the sense that if we did stay in the village, that this was, this was going to be a problem for us. Um, and they were unpredictable. Uh, they were drunk. And so if we stayed there, you know, we were really hedging our bets. So that's why... I decided that we had to get out of there. Mike just came, came along. But then we found ourselves in this jungle and we actually made our way out of the jungle and we found a little dusty road and, and we started to head along that road. But we realized from where we were and from the, the day before, we had actually found, landed ourselves in a national park. It was, it was called the Queen Elizabeth II National Park in Uganda. So here we were at night time walking on this dusty road through the middle of this national park uh, at feeding time. And so <laughs> we, we, we could have kept on going and we had about 30 kilometers to get to where we were trying to get to. So we had to weigh up our, uh, the situation again. So, okay, do we go back and risk death in that village or do we keep on walking through this national park and, and risk getting eaten alive? And actually, uh, we, we ended up going back to the village, believe it or not. So we thought we were safer going back to the village and risking these guys than, than actually the, the wild animals of Africa. So this was the, the decision that we came up with. But as we arrived back at the village, a car pulled up. And I quickly ran up to the car and said, um, you know, we wanted to get on, we wanted to get along to this next village 30 kilometers away. Are you heading in that direction? And they said, yeah, yeah, you, you can, you can come with us and jump in the back of the car. So we got in the car and rather than keeping on going down that road, these guys actually turn into the village. They actually had to fill up with some, some petrol. This is just a little dusty village, you know, really just one street and it had a, a small petrol pump there. And so the guys pulled into the uh, petrol uh, pump and, and filled up and then they disappeared and they were gone for about an hour and the whole time uh, Mike was his name and I were just sitting in the back seat of the car trying to keep a low profile because we were expecting these these uh, rebel soldiers to turn up again at any time and eventually the the two guys in the car came back and they'd clearly been drinking anyway we set we set off on our way and just as we were leaving the village 
there was a pub on the corner and these guys, these crippled soldiers, suddenly poured out of the pub and they were pointing at us, laughing at us, and the guys in the front seat were laughing back and sort of talking in, in their language. And, and, and you know, suddenly we felt we were in an even worse predicament because these guys were obviously in cahoots. So we headed off on this 30 kilometer journey and it was night time. And this is at the edge of what's called the Ruiz, Ruizori mountain range on the border of Zaire, uh, what was Zaire or the, now the Democratic Republic of Congo in Uganda. And it was a little dusty, bumpy road and a sheer drop to one side. Nighttime, these guys were not friendly. They were not talking to us. The music was blaring. There was a huge hole uh, in the, the bottom of the car between where we were sitting and there was dust and exhaust pouring up into the car. And then after a few kilometers, the guy slams on the brakes, gets out of the car and heads around to the boot. So I quickly jump out thinking that the guy's going to grab a gun and shoot us and throw us over the edge. And uh, so I got out and went round and he opened the boot and he got out a, a water container and came round to the, the front of the car, opened the bonnet and, and poured some water in the radiator, which was leaking. And, and so, you know, this terrifying situation and we went, you know, it was a very slow journey. We were only probably doing five, 10 kilometers an hour and it took several hours to get there, but multiple times during the journey, he had to stop and fill up the radiator with water. But we made it, of course, but the whole time we, we were absolutely beside ourselves that, that at some point these guys were gonna shoot us and throw us over the edge. So that's, a, that's the rest of the, the story, but wow. it's... Mm. So, so morph yourself forward, you, you do your year in Africa, you decide that you wanna dedicate yourself to, to the public health system, you come home, you specialize in eye surgery, why and then you you create uh, you know sight for all tell us how tell us how you keep thinking about i need to do more i, I want to give back and what does sight for all do mm, sure sure so i mentioned before that, that the idea of doing doing microsurgery and particularly cataract surgery in poorer countries was something that really appealed so i i came back to adelaide after my time in africa went through my ophthalmology training and from there, I actually went to Jerusalem to work uh, as, as uh, an ophthalmologist in a hospital, an eye hospital, St. John's Eye Hospital run by St. John's. And uh, spent a year there with my, my young wife and uh, we had another extraordinary year. This is, this is another year which was full of adventure and excitement. Jerusalem. What, what, I mean, what was going on in Jerusalem back then? So you're just going from from war zone to war zone. So I mean, you're looking for danger, Dr. James. You're looking for danger, mate. You should have gone into the army, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a bit like that, doesn't it? I, I mean, I do love an adventure. And uh, absolutely, this year in Jerusalem was, was an, another adventure for both of us, actually. Uh, I wasn't going to tell you about Jerusalem because I was actually heading towards, uh, you know, uh, why Sight for All uh, evolved. But I can, I can certainly uh, come to that in a moment. Uh, tell us about Jerusalem. I'm intrigued. Oh, Jerusalem was amazing. So this was a, certainly when we arrived, it was a re relatively peaceful time in Jerusalem. Uh, there was what was called the Intifada, which was the conflict between the, uh, the Muslim and the Jewish people. And, but this was a quiet time. Things were reasonably peaceful and it felt peaceful. Until about halfway through the year when my wife actually worked on the Israeli side. She's a commercial interior architect and on the Palestinian side, which is where the eye hospital was, the St. John's Eye Hospital, uh, there was no uh, architectural firms doing interior architectural work. So I worked as an eye, eye specialist in this hospital and she worked on the Israeli side. And she used to catch two buses to work each day and two buses home. And one morning, she went extra early because it was very, very hot uh, in the middle of summer, you can imagine. So she took a really early bus to work and when she got off the bus and the bus came back round, uh, back towards the suburb where the eye hospital was, it was blown up. So only a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes or so after she got off the bus, that particular bus was blown up in the suburb next to where the eye hospital was, which was on the Israeli side. So she had this extraordinary experience as well. And uh, she, resigned from that job immediately and ended up working with a Palestinian uh, developer on the 
Palestinian side and actually uh, was involved in the refurbishment of one of the biblical churches uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. So she had this extraordinary experience as well. But so that, that really was marked a bit of a turning point, that, that experience. And then the rest of the year was quite uh, stressful, actually. Uh, we had the first Palestinian elections ever in, in, in that part of the world. So that was pretty, pretty tense time. And then we had Rabin's assassination. So Rabin was assassinated. We actually went to his funeral and, and it was, you know, an extraordinary time and things really started to go downhill after then. So, you know, it was quite a relief. It was one of the most extraordinary experiences of our life together. And uh, we, we cherished that time that we had, but again, it was full of adventure full of danger. Uh, I, I also had another experience, a very, very stressful experience when uh, one of the things I really loved to do while we were there, I was able to hone my microsurgical skills. So this was my first year as, as uh, an ophthalmologist outside the training program. So really I was my own boss now. And so it was a great opportunity for me to improve my confidence and competence and, and surgical skills and, and particularly with cataract surgery. Um, so I was loving the opportunity to cure people. So this was, you know, in stark contrast to that experience that as an intern where I was just not feeling like I was achieving anything. And now I was really starting to, to feel I was um, making an impact on people's lives. But one of the other things I really loved was the outreach trips. So we used to go out to the uh, Gaza Strip and to the West Bank, the occupied territories to undertake eye clinics in the refugee camps. And, and that was that was a brilliant experience, uh, but also you know, quite uh, a dangerous experience at times. And uh, what was it like? I mean, what's the Gaza Strip like? Like from a from a physical point of view, like we all we, we people are we've grown up with this conflict, right? I mean, and and so when you go to the Gaza Strip, like no one would think about going to the Gaza Strip. What what's it like physically? What's it like from a from a feeling point of view? Is it how do you deal with that? What is it? Yeah, so the Gaza Strip, uh, as you're aware, it's a, um, it's a part, of, uh, uh, part of that world which is essentially cordoned off from the rest of the world. So to get into the Gaza Strip, you actually have a checkpoint and it's quite a rigorous process. The cars all get searched, you get searched. So you, you feel like you're entering a war zone. So it's all cordoned off from, from the rest of the world. It's only a small strip of land. It faces the Mediterranean Sea, but on all three sides, really, it's, it's basically enclosed in there. And you, you, you then go into the city, Gaza City itself, and that's where we did the eye clinic. And it's tense. It's, um, it's certainly not a beautiful part of the world. It's a, it's a ramshackle uh, a city, uh, but it's a functioning city. And you know, once you're actually in the city itself, there's nothing but hospitality. In fact, uh, you know, whenever we went out to the refugee camps and the villages in, in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, we, we had the most wonderful experiences. The, the Palestinians were so warm and welcoming. And, you know, once we'd finished our eye clinic for the day, we would have uh, a feast. They would always uh, have a feast for us. And, and it was, you know, it was a special experience. So very warm, very hospitable. And even within the Gaza Strip, you know, a, a part of the world which is which is extremely tense, um, then you you, um, you know have this lovely warmth and hospitality there. So you, you didn't feel once you're in there, once you're you're uh, you know working and doing your eye clinic, uh, you, you were oblivious to what was going on outside. And certainly we we hear and we know of regular uh, attacks that happen really both ways across that uh, that border between Israel and, and uh, the Palestinian territory. Uh, but fortunately, when we were there. Uh, we didn't have any such experience. Uh, but I actually, my, I remember my very first outreach trip to a refugee camp, sorry, a refugee camp in one of the West Bank uh, villages and uh, a machine gun battle broke out between two Palestinian factions right next to the eye clinic where I was working. And I, uh, of course, that was the first time I'd experienced anything like that. And I, I turned to one of the nurses uh, from the hospital who was helping me and said, oh my God, you know, what's going on here? And I said, ah, oh, no, don't worry. That's just a, it's just a battle between two Palestinian factions. It happens all the time. And so, you know, you were just surrounded. You, you realized you were in a war zone. So it was, it was tense. And uh, another, there was another time when we were coming back from one of the West Bank villages 
And it was a month after one of the Palestinian terrorist leaders was assassinated by the Israelis. And so in the Muslim uh, religion, I think about 30 days after someone dies, there's a, like they have a wake or a celebration, I suppose. And so we were coming back, I think it was through Nablus and we were in the hospital van and we actually found ourselves in this huge mass of people. And it was as those images were from, you know, we remember them from the news where they're, you know, burning effigies of, of uh, burning Israeli flags and, and burning effigies of, of Israeli leaders and, and uh, burning tires and things like that. And there was, there was hostility and danger and the, the, and the air was, was thick with, with menace. It was absolutely terrifying. So we suddenly found ourselves in the middle of this group of people and as soon as they saw the hospital van, we were surrounded by you know, quite literally hundreds of angry people. Now, the important point here is that the, uh, the license plates, if you from the Palestinian territories, you have blue license plates. If you're from the Israeli, uh, if you're from Israel or from Jerusalem, you have yellow number plates. So although we were a Palestinian hospital treating Palestinian people, uh, they saw yellow number plates, they saw Israelis and they were wanting to rip the van apart and, and probably tear us to shreds. But uh, the driver and the nurse who were both Palestinian quickly wound down the windows and said, it's okay, you know, we're from the eye hospital. And it was like Moses parting the waves or the people just parted and let us through and we're able to proceed on our way. But again, you know, another very tense and, and uh, terrifying experience. And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because at the time, you think the first thing one would do once uh, you were captured by rebel soldiers in Uganda or if you were having that confronting experience in Israel, you'd be on the next plane home. Um, but, you know, at that age, I think, you know, you're invincible you're in, and uh, it's just one of life's fantastic adventures. And I look back at those experiences and think, my goodness, how did I actually uh, ever decide that that was a, a good thing to do or, or, or that I should even stay in that part of the world when I'm constantly, uh, you know, putting my life at risk and, and potentially my wife as well how, how do you so you 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 know you created co-founded you know um site for all and you mentioned to me last week that so how do you deal with uganda where there's real poverty you know you, you deal with uh, the gaza strip where you know people are so appreciative they're giving you a feed and then you come back into the western world and you're going into poverty in your own country how does how, how do you sort of deal with that mentally and and tell us a little bit about sight for all and where the motivation came from sure so after after jerusalem i actually went on to london i studied eye cancer and then came back yeah, to adelaide in mid 98 so um so, uh, 22 years ago now and i knew that i wanted to keep on working in poorer parts of the world and i wanted to continue to uh, work to uh, fight blindness in poorer parts of the world. So we settled, I, I bought into a practice, you know, there was no more, you know, going for great lengths of time. So there were a number of colleagues that were working in the Department of Ophthalmology, in, in the eye department at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, who were interested in, in this field. So fighting blindness in poorer communities. And so I, I got involved with them and got involved in a number of research and teaching projects uh, in Asia. And, and Asia is home to half the world's blind adults and two thirds of the world's blind kids. So you know, this is a, 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 particularly the poorer countries of Asia, it's a serious problem. And so uh, I, there are a number of experiences which ultimately filled me with a passion to want to do something, to want to make a change. And, number of very, very powerful experiences. But the one that really springs to mind was in 2007. So I was part of a research team from the Royal Adelaide Hospital undertaking a chart of blindness study in Myanmar in Southeast Asia. So this was a study to determine the causes of blindness amongst children in schools for the blind across the country. And what we found was absolutely staggering and, and confronting. We found that nearly half of the kids had blindness that could have been prevented or treated. So that was something that was, you know, in itself was pretty, pretty powerful. But the thing that really had such a deep impact on myself and in fact on, on the entire team was the leading cause of blindness that we found, which was measles. So imagine that most people wouldn't even be aware that measles could cause blindness, but it actually caused blindness in the most 
painful and disfiguring way and it's irreversible once a child is blind from measles and so to be surrounded at seven schools for the blind with kids who are irreversibly blinded by measles was just one of the most so, uh, so not so measles uh is is it a side effect of the measles? So not everyone gets blind from measles. You're just unlucky. How does that work? Or measles is going to call blindness. I don't. So here as a country, you know, we're talking, there's the anti-vaxxers. Uh, there's, we have measles vaccines. One of the things that, uh, one of the many vaccines that we have in childhood to prevent the, the really terrible complications of, of measles. And one of which is, is loss of vision blindness. It damages the cornea, the front windows to the eyes. So, so here's a country that had very little reach of its vaccination program. In fact, they were very suspicious of, of uh, vaccines at the time. And so there was, there was limited, there was, we didn't have that herd immunity that we've heard about with COVID. Um, we didn't have a herd immunity in, in Myanmar that allowed them to, to fight measles. Um, so when a child gets measles, it can kill them, uh, it can have a number of devastating complications, and blindness is just one of those, probably or almost certainly exacerbated by poorer nutrition. So when you have a poor nutrition, uh, measles becomes particularly dangerous. And so, yeah, so this was, this was a really powerful experience. It, it actually made me realise that there's so much more to blindness than being cataract and being able to cure cataract. And it really drove home to me, for the first time, how powerful prevention is in medicine. So now I've come full circle. I've gone from being frustrated by not being able to cure uh, patients as an intern with chronic diseases that were pretty much self-inflicted through to you know, loving the ability to cure people through cataract surgery and other, other uh, uh, diseases that we were treating um, to now seeing firsthand the devastating effects on kids who had to then live a lifetime of blindness because they just hadn't been vaccinated for measles. And the other thing that we saw, we, ha we actually also found a similar result in schools for the blind in, in Cambodia and in Laos. So we found that measles is a big problem. But the other thing that we found, you know, we were surrounded by kids who are blind from measles, but we occasionally found children who are visually impaired, even blind because they'd never been tested for spectacles because there was no one available in their country to be able to provide something that we take for granted in our country. So again, you know, a, a very readily preventable cause of loss of vision and blindness. And so now uh, I've really changed my mindset towards something that, that uh, could be addressed quite easily. Well, I might get onto that shortly because I know that you've, you've, um, you've, you've moved into some other passions, but you had to give up operating because of focal dystonia is that right so yes you here's this passion you have you're doing all this great work and i imagine the motivation that you're getting from putting a pair of glasses on a young child that then can see or curing someone through cataract and that's taken away from you how did you deal with that mentally that was so that happened uh, i was diagnosed with focal dystonia in 2012 so by that stage i'd had 20 or 20 years of operating or 20 or more years of operating. And the operating was becoming difficult. I, I actually didn't know what was going on. I was just holding the surgical instruments with my right hand with, with increasing force. And, and it was just giving rise to this dis discomfort in my hand. And particularly by the end of the long operating list, you know, my, my heart, hand was quite uh, sore. It wasn't impacting on my surgical skills, but it just was concerning me. And uh, so it wasn't, until 2012 when I actually gave one of my neurology, sorry, neurology colleagues a call and he was able to tell me uh, immediately over the phone that, that you have focal dystonia. And what, is it? what is that for us butchers in the world? Yeah, so it's a cortical neurodegenerative condition. It's actually genetic, so my father had it. Uh, and we didn't actually realize until I had my diagnosis that the dad, you know, what, what, what what a dad been through. Dad always held his pen in a funny way and he had bad handwriting, but no one actually knew what, what, uh, what was going on in dad. So uh, when I had this, this diagnosis, it was, it was great to suddenly be aware of what was causing this and what was the underlying problem. So just to give you a bit of an idea of focal dystonia. So when the brain tells a given muscle to contract, at the same time, it has to silence opposing muscles 
And so when you're doing very fine work with your hand, there's a complex series of messages going from the cortex down to your hands and back again. It's very sophisticated. So when you're doing sophisticated fine work, the focal dystonia interferes with your ability to do that. So, so really it was uh, manifesting initially by just holding the instruments very tightly. I was also holding my pen really tightly as well and that was also causing me some problem. Uh, and, and it was something that was slowly progressive. And so because it was slowly progressive, I had time to adapt and I actually uh, had a series of what I call micro innovations that I engaged over several years to, to adapt, to hold my instruments in different ways. You know, just things that were happening in my everyday life. I was, you know, shaving and I was cutting myself regularly because I was having difficulty holding the, the razor blade. So I then bought myself an electric shaver and then I started using my left hand and then I started using my left hand to do virtually everything I could using the electric toothbrush, um, using a spoon. So, you know, these days, if I wind the clock, a few years forward, if I held a champagne flute with my right hand, I'd smash it. So that's how little control I have over my hand function these days. So uh, you can imagine it was, it was a year later. So 2012 diagnosis, 2013, I, I actually started writing with my left hand. So I went cold turkey to my left hand. And then I had a, an operating list, a cataract surgery list, where I had a close call. Fortunately, it wasn't a, a disaster, uh, but there's a very fine line in cataract surgery between a successful result and a disaster. And at the end of that list, I, I turned to the scrub nurse and said, that's it, I've just finished my uh, last cataract operation. And I was in a daze for a few days. I was thinking, uh, you know, have I been hasty in this decision? Am, 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 I, you know, am I doing the right thing here? And, and it took me a few days to realize, yes, I am putting my patients at risk. I absolutely have to give this up. And so then I canceled my upcoming list and I transferred my patients to, to my colleagues. So it was, it was a, a, definitely a tough moment. Now I'd, as I mentioned before, I'd, I'd worked, studied, trained uh, pretty much all my life to become a doctor, then a surgeon, then a microsurgeon. Um, and then having to give it up perhaps 20 years before I would have otherwise had to. So I really had to, you know, to, to dig deep, to, to draw on that inner strength uh, because it was a confronting uh, experience. But I think I was comfortable with it because the surgery was becoming more difficult. I was actually not looking forward to my surgical list anymore. So in a, in a sense, it was a bit of a relief. When I finally said, that's it, no more. It was actually quite a relief. And, and so that made it easier for me to, to get through that process. Tell me what, in your, in, your, in your experience for you personally, what inner strength was at that time, if you could list it out for us. So you went into yourself and you said, right, okay, inner strength for me needs to be what? Hmm. I think I was telling myself at the time, so there's a number of operations that we do in ophthalmology and perhaps one of the most exacting, one of the most technically exacting is the cataract operation. So that was the first one to go, but I resolved to myself that, okay, there's a number of other operations I can still continue to do. And so uh, I'm just gonna continue to do those. I'm not enjoying cataract surgery anymore. So I'm gonna stay positive and I'm going to continue uh, doing these other things and, and still helping people. So that, that was fantastic. But over the next three years, one by one, I, I had to give up the less technically exacting surgeries until 2016 when I finished my, my last operation. So as I was saying, it was, a, it was a slow progressive process. And I think that gave me time to adjust in my mind and to look forward to, uh, to other things. So uh, that, that staying positive, keeping a cool head, you know, as I mentioned in that experience in Africa, when I was captured by soldiers, having that, that, that cool head, and not letting the emotions get the better of me, and then saying to myself, okay, um, you know, this is, this is not great, but let's look on the positive side. Uh, I gave up some of my, my surgical list because uh, I was no longer operating. It, it allowed me time to dedicate more to Site for All, and, and Site for All at that time was really starting to grow and, and, and really starting to have serious impact. So I, I, I was trying to squeeze sight for all in when I was working full time. I used to call it my second full time job. I used to wake up early in the morning. I used to work in the evenings in between patients, lunch times. I always took a day off so that I had time to dedicate to other pursuits. And all of this was getting consumed by sight for all. So 
when I gave up my surgical list, I suddenly had more time to dedicate to it. So that was great. So, so I was able to fill up that time uh, very productively and that, that allowed me to uh, keep that positive mindset. Uh, I think also the, well, the work we were doing with Sightful and the positive rewards that we were seeing uh, far outweighed for me the negative impact of not being able to operate anymore. And as I said, I, I, I had been operating for, uh, by the time I gave up surgery, something like 26 years. So, you know, I'd had a pretty good run. And so, uh, you know, life throw these things at you. And so you actually have to, rather than letting them get, get you down, you have to keep positive and say, okay, well, let's look for other opportunities. Let's, let's open this other door and see what that has to offer. And, and so I think that, that uh, was how I was able to get through that, that process. So Australian of the Year, Order of Australia in 2012, the Australian Medical Association President's Leadership Award, uh, Ernest and Young Social Entrepreneur for Australia in 2015, the University of Adelaide Distinguished Alumni Award in 2019. So when I throw that sort of stuff at you, what's your reaction? Uh, I try not to let, I, I try, to be honest, I try not to think about it. And, uh, you know, I've had this extraordinary opportunity this year as Australian of the Year, and uh, no sooner had I received the award, which happened on the Australia Day weekend, than things all went to shit with the, the COVID pandemic. And in the first couple of weeks of that award, I was, um, I had something like 60 speaking engagement already booked for the year. I was gonna be away for most, most weekends and had uh, all sorts of exciting opportunities. And, and pretty much once the virus hit, all of those things were cancelled. So it was pretty disheartening. But the world has been consumed by COVID-19. And, uh, you know, often the Australian of the Year really comes along with a little bit of a, a high-profile celebrity status. But I feel like I've flown under the radar, which I'm quite comfortable with. I, I, I'm actually quite happy flying under the radar. But I think the thing for me which has been disappointing was that this was the year to have recognition for site fraud and the work that site fraud is doing. So that's the one thing I feel particularly disappointed about that, that I've not been able to uh, really fly the flag as much as I could have for site fraud. Uh, you know, these speaking engagements all, uh, all dissolved. Um, and what I did, again, I, we talked about innovation before, you know, I was, I was quite despondent in those early weeks. But then I realized, okay, let's make the best of this situation. And I come back to my keeping a cool head. I, I, I didn't let this overwhelm me. I stayed positive. And when I moved into this positive mindset, I said, okay, what am I gonna do here? I'm going to innovate and, and, and how am I gonna get my message out as Australian of the year uh, to as many people as possible? Uh, if I don't have these speaking opportunities, well, let's, let's take it online. So I created three keynote presentations one about resilience, one about social entrepreneurship, and one about the toxic impact of sugar in our society. And I started reaching out to um, all sorts of organizations and bodies, uh, offering myself to, to give uh, keynote presentations by webinars. And then I also sought out opportunities to give podcasts and, and became active on social media. And there's a post that I put out a, a week or so ago, which has had about 150,000 views. So, you know, perhaps this opportunity that COVID has given me to, to take this online has meant that I've had a bigger reach this year than I would have otherwise, you know, jet sitting around Australia, uh, giving live presentations. So once again, just trying to stay positive that, that uh, you know, using that innovation to, to create opportunities. We'll get, we'll get back to the staying positive, but one interesting thing for me is obviously you're a passionate man and, and you believe in prevention now, and you just use two words, um, that probably would create a divide in, in opinion. So toxic sugar, <laughs> right? So, so um, you know, we spoke offline last time we met about your passion um, around too much sugar in our diet, but also uh, getting trolled and bullied and, and, and told you're an idiot online. So take us a little bit into the sugar story, but tell us how you actually dealt with, you know, um, being told online that you should go and jump somewhere or I mean I th I'm sure you've got some real good ones and how you dealt with that because one of the things that especially around mental health and I talk a lot to our youth that's that online bullying that that anonymous abuse of you or that 
collective bullying, which is so hard for people to deal with. Sure. So just briefly, uh, and I'm sure I'm not sure the, the figures in New Zealand, but in Australia, we now have about 1.7 million people with type 2 diabetes, which is a, a dietary disease, largely preventable, related to the consumption of too much sugar and refined carbohydrates in our diet. But there are some communities which have been very severely impacted. You know, lower socioeconomic areas has been heavily impacted. Uh, for example, Greater Western Sydney, 50% of adults over the age of 24 have either type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, half of the population. Did you say Great Western Sydney? Greater, Greater Western Sydney, yeah. Sydney? Greater Western Sydney, yeah. And there are other lower socioeconomic areas in Australia where there's also similar concerning statistics. In Aboriginal communities, as in the Maori community in New Zealand, diabetes has been Terror, uh, t devastating. So there's been an 80-fold, 80 80-fold 80 increase in, in type 2 diabetes in Aboriginal people in Australia in the last 40 years. So this exposure to this horrendous diet, which is high in sugar that, that, that we have, has been just devastating for their health. And we're now seeing this disease it used to be called maturity onset diabetes in, in kids, and, and in kids as young as seven. And there's actually a famous case in the UK of a three-year-old child with type 2 diabetes. So it's, it's becoming a, a real scourge, a real epidemic, killing far more people than COVID-19. In the first four months of the pandemic in Australia, there were 102 deaths due to COVID-19, which is a tragedy, of course, but at the same time, over 5,000 deaths due to type 2 diabetes. So it's a long story um, how, we, how we got here, um, but of course, you know, we can parallel the situation with the, the smoking and tobacco, the devastations of smoking on our health. Tobacco was one, was one thing. Sugar, however, uh, entails, a, a, it's much broader, much deeper, much more difficult because it involves not just the sugar cane farmers, uh, the sugar uh, producers, the, the beverages industry, the processed food industry, uh, you name it, it's, it's, it's very deep and very broad. Um, the, the people that don't want to, Dr. Muki to be uh, giving these messages that sugar is bad for us. Uh, there's so much conflicts, there's religious ideology, there's uh, um, in industry influence as well. And it's very hard for the government to, to act on that because uh, there is money in it, there's votes in it. You know, the sugarcane uh, farming areas in Northern Queensland are in marginal seats. So neither one of our major parties wants to make a call on, on it. So it's a very, very difficult field. And uh, so, of course, once you actually start talking out and raising awareness, and then there will people coming out to try and silence you. So I had this wonderful weekend on the Australia Day weekend when I received the award, and then I got back to work on the Tuesday morning, and there were a series of emails which were quite confronting. I can't quite recall, but there was one trolling email that was telling me to shut up, and, and uh, uh, not quite so uh, gently as that. Uh, and that hit me hard. I, I suppose I should have been Hey, one, I'll read one out for you. I've got it right here. Why is the solution to every problem in this country attached? If you're a fucking dumb enough to drink six liters of Coke a day and eat McDonald's for every meal, then you deserve to get it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, did you respond? What did you do? No, no, I didn't respond. But that, but that very first one uh, that I received was... It did, it did hit me harder because so, I wasn't expecting it. I should have expected, but I wasn't expecting it. And it, and it really uh, it was quite uh, confronting for me and, and something that uh, uh, I'd never experienced before, I think, in my life. But fortunately, I think, as Australian of the Year, I'm in a somewhat protected situation. You know, often the trolls come out to attack people in high-profile uh, settings and celebrities and so forth. They're, they they put themselves out there, and so they're they're uh, often the target of of trolling attacks. But fortunately, I haven't had as many as I probably would have expected. And I think as Australian of the Year, it's not very Australian to attack the Australian of the Year, is it? So perhaps that's why I've been uh, protected to some extent. Um, but the second time it happened, and in the meantime, I've actually read read a book called Troll Hunting, which actually. Um, uh, it was, uh, was an interesting read by an Australian author. And uh, there have been a number of really devastating consequences of trolling, including, including suicide. And so 
uh, I read this book and it made me realize that the best thing to do with, with trolling is just to ignore them. It's so tempting to respond because quite, it's interesting the number of trolling messages where they, they actually say, I'm an educated person. They, they say that uh, quite regularly. So they're trying to convince you that they're educated and they know what they're talking about. But uh, often what they're talking about is, is nonsense. And so the best thing is not to feed the trolls. Just park them, uh, ignore them. And in fact, uh, when I received my second trolling email message, it, it made me smile and I actually thought, oh, you poor thing. You know, I actually should probably feel sorry for them because, you know, life for them must be sad, empty. For them to have to do that, it's, uh, it's uh, one wonders what has happened in their life that they feel that they need to do that. But, um, you know, that can't be my problem. Uh, my, my, what I need to do is, is uh, not let that drag me down and just read it, smile, park it and, and move on. And that's probably the best thing to do. Not, certainly not feed the troll, not to let, let it get you down. Um, once you start engaging in it, and, and, and actually on social media, there are some people that come out and one could call it trolling, but they are coming from an educated viewpoint and they are in the business world. You know, on LinkedIn, I often get people trying to uh, counter my, uh, my opinions or the things that I'm saying, which I, I tend to be all evidence-based. And I'm able to then, you know, have a rational argument or discussion with them on, on, on social media. And so, you know, I think that's quite, uh, uh, quite fair enough if you want to go down that pathway of having a constructive argument with someone on social media. But the trolls who come out with those sort of messages that you just read out, you just ignore them. Yeah, you're in a hut. Yeah, think you might get killed. You go in a car with, you know, with a couple of soldiers for 30K. You know, you're in the Gaza Strip. You know, you're creating all these amazing things. You've had all these awards that totally deserved. I mean, your story is intriguing. Uh, COVID comes along and sounds, and you are obviously a naturally positive person. So you've always seen glass half full. COVID comes along and you start suffering from stress and anxiety, which sits you on your, on your bum a wee bit and you go, wow, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was uh, the first time I'd ever felt that sort of anxiety, that partly the anxiety was due to the, uh, I suppose, the trolling and, and some of the negativity, which I probably wouldn't call trolling, but you know, just the sense of um, people not wanting to hear the message uh, it was uh, unsettling. Uh, and for me, having had all of those pretty confronting experiences, felt like I was a pretty resilient character, suddenly, you know, feeling, feeling anxious. Um, you know, one, during anxious times, and this is when the body, you know, is, is flooded with the stress hormone cortisol. You know, so you, you might have an experience. And <laughs> I had also a number of experiences in Africa where I was attacked by wild animals. And, and, and when you're attacked by a wild animal, you know, immediately your primitive part of the brain fires up and, and it's a fight or flight reaction, which is absolutely appropriate. You're in a life-threatening situation. You've got to get out of there. So a surge of adrenaline, surge of cortisol, and, and, and you fight for your life. When you're captured by rebel soldiers in Uganda, you, um, uh, it's not acutely life-threatening, uh, but it's an anxious situation and you need to be able to deal with that and you need to get, get into this cool-headed scenario. When you're in a more chronically stressful situation, like we've been, many of us through the last few months of the COVID pandemic, people have lost their jobs. Uh, you know, people have had a devastating, the lockdowns in, in some parts of the world have been, have been very hard on people's mental health. Uh, it's very tempting to, to turn to unhealthy habits to deal with the stress. So the body or the brain needs to balance that cortisol reaction with, with the release of feel-good chemicals like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, etc. So you can take the unhealthy options. You can you know, drink too much alcohol. Uh, you can go for illicit drugs. You can eat too much sugary food, smoke cigarettes, etc. All of those things trigger dopamine release from uh, our brains, from the feel-good center of our brains. And that does counter the, the, the stress. And that's why people often do it. But there are other much healthier ways, of course, you know, go, quite simply going for exercise, going for vigorous walk or run, uh, 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 
listening to some of your favorite music, you know, reaching out to other people who are having a tougher time and you're doing a good deed. These have all been shown neuroscientifically to be a very effective and as effective as sugar in countering that cortisol reaction. So in those early weeks when I was feeling uh, despondent, I would go for a walk uh, each day up in the Adelaide Hills, I mean, this beautiful hills. And in fact, I went for a walk first thing this morning and that just gives you that surge uh, of feel-good chemicals that help counter that stress. And I'd get to the top of the hill and I'd look down over the lights of Adelaide. Sometimes in the middle of winter, it was, it was, it was pitch black at about sort of six in the morning and uh, looking out over the lights of Adelaide and it just looked stunning. You felt like you're in Los Angeles. And when I, when I was up there, I would then look out and I would stop for a few minutes and just think of the things that I had to look forward to during the day. And the combination of those two things, uh, and I didn't avoid alcohol, I still enjoyed, uh, you know, a whiskey uh, most evenings. And uh, so I wasn't, but I just wasn't overindulging in those sorts of things. But uh, I'm not a saint, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, going for that vigorous walk in the mornings, uh, getting to the top of the hill, thinking of the things that I had to look forward to the, during the day, because there's always things to look forward to. And the other thing that I did at the end of the day before I fell asleep was to look back at my day and, and just reminisce on the things that had happened during the day, which were wonderful, that I had to be grateful for. And what's interesting about this is that um, there is neuroscience behind this. There was a classic study by Emmons and McCulloch in 2003 that showed if you reinforce positive messages for a couple of minutes a day over a three week period, you're already starting to move yourself into a positive mindset. So it comes from the field of neuroscience called neuromodulation. So how we pay attention can actually change the brain through uh, changes in neural connectivity. So there is actually neuroscience behind it. It's not, it's not uh, waffle. So, um, you know, during those stressful early weeks of the pandemic, I don't think I've ever felt more positive. Uh, and, and that positive mindset allowed me then to say, okay, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to get my messages out there and, and allow me to have that headspace to, to then innovate and, and do what I did? So really important uh, points there. And there are a number of other things that people can do. Uh, I think the you know, eating well and, and exercising that uh, healthy, uh, healthy living is very important during stressful times, trying to get a good night's sleep, surrounding yourself with good friends. So, um, you know, trying to avoid toxic people, trying to really have those connections with people who are positive and uplifting. Uh, so all of those things help us get through these tough times. What are you reading at the moment? Uh, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading a book called India. Uh, I love India, I have a bit of a love affair with India as well. Uh, and it is by V.S. Naipaul, who's a Nobel uh, Prize winner for literature. So it's really, it, it's, it's, it's about 30 years old actually, but it's a, it's a history of India and it's, uh, it's um, yeah, I'm, I've only just started it. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, not able to share too many gleanings, but it's, it just goes into great depth into the history of India. What would you recommend that I read to change or educate myself around sugar? Ah, yes. Okay. So there's a number of books, but I think the book, which was a turning point for me because I'm a doctor, you know, I should know about the dangers of sugar, but I wasn't aware that sugar was addictive. I wasn't aware that we were using, that we use sugar to alleviate stress uh, as, as a doctor. And that, it sounds staggering, doesn't it? So then how would everyday man on the person on the street uh, be aware of, of the dangers of sugar? So as I was, coming into the Australia Day ceremony those early weeks, I, um, uh, I started doing a bit of reading because I felt this responsibility. If, I'm going, if I do receive the award, I wasn't expecting to receive the award. Uh, if I do receive the award, I have a responsibility here to really get to the root cause of type 2 diabetes, which is uh, the excessive sugar and, and uh, refined carbohydrates. When I say refined carbohydrates, I'm talking about things like white flour, white rice, potatoes. They're pretty much pure starch, which is broken down into glucose when it reaches the gut. So when you're having those uh, food stuffs, you're pretty much eating sugar. So I read a book called uh, the uh, called Diabetes Code by Jason Fung. So in those few weeks leading up to that, uh, this was a really, really 
important book for me because it, it, it sets out very clearly how we've, how we've reached this situation in the world where type 2 diabetes has grown fourfold in the last 40 years. It goes into, into the, the biochemistry, but not so much that, that um, you know, non-scientists, non-medical people can read it. I, I would strongly recommend it because it gives you a very good insight into how this has arisen uh, and very good analogies which help you understand it. So uh, the, the Diabetes Code is, is an excellent one to read. So in your day, you go for a walk, do something physical. You're very, you look, you've got something to look forward to. Uh, at the end of the day, retrospectively, you are grateful. Um, so what's in your goodie basket for today? A goodie basket for me is something um, that I look forward to every day. So what's in your goodie basket today? Oh, I've, got, I've always have a number of things in my goodie basket. So tonight I'm giving a, a live presentation to one of the residential colleges in Adelaide. Uh, so it'll be my sixth live presentation, sorry, my fifth live presentation for the year. You know, having a year full of, of live presentations, which all went, uh, things are starting to fire up now. So I'm giving a live presentation to a group of students, which I'm looking forward to, that'd be great. The other thing I'm looking forward to, in fact, when I got off the podcast, uh, I'm going to be, well, I'm actually part of the expert advisory group, which is looking at a refresh of our national diabetes strategy. So I'm part of that group and I have put forward to that group. In fact, there was a group of uh, 20 to 30 people we met about six weeks ago. And uh, I was the person that said to the group, I was the only person that said to the group that type two diabetes is potentially reversible in many people. There's now over a hundred controlled clinical studies that show that this disease is reversible. This is such critical information to know. So um, today we're meeting again for a couple of hours and in about an hour's time. So I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to solidify that in the national diabetes strategy. It's not even in the national diabetes strategy. So if I can get reversibility of type two diabetes into the national diabetes strategy for Australia, to me, that will be a huge uh, victory. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Who would you like me to interview next in Open Minded? Ah, I think someone to interview next would be Dr. Gary Fetke. And Dr. Gary Fetke is an extraordinary man. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon from Tasmania. Like me, he one of the turning points for me a couple of years ago was to meet a, a man who went suddenly blind overnight due to his type 2 diabetes. He had sudden bleeding into both eyes. And his story was so powerful that for me, it was a real turning point, a real eye opener for me, excuse the pun, uh, to, uh, to my journey in, into the realms of type 2 diabetes and the preventability and reversibility of type 2 diabetes. Again, coming back to the prevention thing. And so Gary was an orthopedic surgeon and every week was chopping off legs amputating legs, which were gangrenous due to type two diabetes. And he just found that overwhelming and started giving uh, advice to his patients because he understood the biochemistry very well, uh, that sugar was a major, uh, in, a major force in this to reduce or give up the sugar in your, in your diet. And he was telling his patients to do this. He was then reported by one of the dietitians at his hospital to the hospital board. He was then struck off and was investigated, had a star chamber investigation for two and a half years, uh, was eventually exonerated, but had a, uh, you can imagine, had a, a, a terrific toll on him and his professional credibility. And both him and his wife, who's, who's also an extraordinary character, started delving into how this, how this story unfolded, how this happened. How could this possibly happen? How can a doctor who's giving his patient sensible advice to reduce sugar in their diet can get investigated by our medical board uh, and, and struck off? Unbelievable. So that, that story is, is quite something. Wow. And I would strongly recommend you uh, interview Gary. Dr. James, I talk, I, I say to a lot of people when I'm doing my mental health talks, um, one thing I never did was congratulations to me. And, um, you know, we often don't stop. I could talk to you for, we've probably gone over time. I could talk to you all day. Congratulations, my friend. You are amazing. I hope you do take five minutes to say congratulations to me every day. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you've inspired me. And like I said, 
I could probably do another hour, but thank you for sharing. You have an amazing life. You deserve everything uh, that you've been awarded. And it's been an absolute pleasure for me to have you on Open Minded, my friend. Thank you so much, Jake. I've really enjoyed it. And also congratulations to your mentor me. What you're achieving there is incredible. And what you've achieved through your career and with the All Blacks, uh, you know, I was glued glued to the TV set for virtually all of those matches. So I, I know it very well. Uh, Still, it's the one thing that probably brings me to tears is, is uh, watching the Wallabies uh, in action. <laughs> and uh, so we look forward to those next couple of matches and, and uh, hopefully we have some goodies. Well, we'll put, a little, we'll put a little bottle of wine on it. There you go. I'll bring, okay. you bring one from Adelaide. I'll bring one. I've got a wine company. So next time we meet on the game on Sunday, it's a draw this week. Whoever wins, we'll, we'll, we'll shout each other a wine. You're on. Okay, we'll look forward to that. That'll be, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. See you, mate. Thank you.